with the singing of O Thou Made Beauty. Oh, oh Thou Who Made the Beauty, sorry. Page five. Mm -hmm. Now, it is my very great pleasure to welcome to the podium to fill us, to cheer us, to inspire us, one of the most authentic persons that I know, a person who shares from her very heart, a person who I've had the privilege to share teaching many, many classes for numerous years and it is my pleasure to be the trim to her psyche you know psyche and trim we I, I, I we accept that designation she's a psyche I am the trim welcome our beloved Reverend Anne Chandler <laughs> Besides being called Annie, I now have a new name, Psyche. <laughs> good morning, good morning, everyone. Let me add my own words of welcome. Welcome to our guests from Spirited Travel, the LC Beamon home, my friend, Mrs. Castro, over in the corner there, who I've not seen for quite a while, right, and others over there who I have not seen as well. Thank you all, and welcome to those who are joining us on the World Wide Web. In Christmas of this year, I was given a journal from a, a beloved congregant of ours. It's a journal that I treasure, as it affords me the facility of recording my thoughts, insights, and just about anything that attracts my interest. On the front cover, there's a scripture phrase that is taken from Hebrews 6, verse 19. That phrase is, and I quote, hope anchors the soul. This chapter in Hebrews is about God's promises. It mentions immutability, which is another, a simpler word is unchanging. It mentions God's counsel, direction, wisdom, the provision of a refuge, the multiplication of blessings, which we are all heirs to. And on this hope, we can anchor the soul. It is sure and steadfast. Lamentations 3 reminds us 
of just that too from verse 20. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. Thus I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him." End of quote. My question this morning to all of us is, where is your vision set? Are your hopes moving you in the direction of that vision of a life more abundant? Our Declaration of Principles reminds us the universal spirit, which is God, operates through a universal mind, which is the law of God, and that we are surrounded by this creative mind, which receives the direct impress of our thought and acts upon it. We also believe in the healing of the sick and the control of conditions through the power of this mind. Then it behoves us to look at the thoughts that are impressed in this creative mind. Each day we experience the faithfulness of these, prom um, these promises, abundant blessings, the ability to experience a new, a more, more of the givingness of life. Sri Aurobindo, an Indian point stated, the mystical meaning behind the creation is that it existed for the delight of God. So in fact, once we are guided to reveal our purpose, our vision, we are experiencing a life that can only be a delight to our creator. So we are moving towards the creation of a vision that delights us and indeed the environment that we inhabit. So let us look at some of the indicators. What is our general perception of life? What is our daily prayer like? Is our life ruled by the perceptions of separation or the filters that pronounce our inadequacies or idiosyncrasies. Guy Finley of the Lost Secrets of Prayer states, and I quote, you cannot receive anything more from life than the way you think toward it. You cannot think toward life other than the way you see it. You cannot see life other than the ideas you have about it. So to change what you receive from life, you must have a new perception of it beginning with new ideas about it. You can't begin receiving anything truly new from this life as long as you continue to see it as you presently do, which is through your present ideas about it. This is important. Our perception now, the way we tend to see ourselves, is determined largely by one particular idea we have about this life of ours. We believe life comes to us from outside of us, meaning that as you and I see life, it seems to originate out there and then comes towards us eventually entering our experience." End of quote. But by the way, I have Dr. Sona here who is my scientist. She will help me with this part. Dr. Bruce Lipton of the New Biology scientifically states that a new science of epigenetics rec recognizes that environmental signals are the primary regulators of gene activity. In other words, we are controlled by our beliefs. It is our beliefs that adjust our physiology. It is our beliefs that adjust the selection of our genes. The new biology is based upon the fact that perception controls behavior and gene activity. This revised version of science emphasizes the reality that we are Act, that we actively control our genetic expression moment by moment throughout our daily lives. Rather than seeing ourselves as victims of our genes, we must come to the responsibility that our perceptions are dynamically shaping our biology and behavior." End of quote. So with that in mind, we are taught here that we are individualizations of spirit. We express its attributes. Then new every moment, we are assured that the faithfulness of the law must manifest the mercies that we have imprinted in our mind. That is natural for us to receive. Every desire we have 
must move in the general direction of our vision or prayer, that we experience the givingness of life because we are beloved expressions of spirit. We are guided by the light of wisdom. We are empowered by a law that supports us. That is unchanging. We dwell in the assurance of peace as the beauty of right action unfolds as the compassion that does not fail and the joy of knowing that our existence is founded upon the delight of our God. Elizabeth Towney, a pioneer New Thought writer and member of the International New Thought Alliance, of which we are members, wrote a true story that she heard in the final conclusion of her book, How to Grow Success. I gather her books would be found in the library of Marcus Garvey. Yes, it's true. <laughs> It goes like this. This story is about the strength of desire and the importance of staying the course in changing the direction of our perceptions to that which is totally aligned with the life more abundant. Two men committed a crime. One of these men was sentenced to five years in the penitentiary which he served after snugly hiding away his half of the stolen money. The other narrowly escaped. The one who went to prison hatched while there a beautiful scheme for getting even with the world. He had been sent to prison for appropriating a paltry little $10,000, while such men as Rockefeller stole millions and were toadied. Now he proposed to get even by stealing a cool half million from the world. Upon his re release, he hunted up his old pal who after spending his $5,000 had been having a hard time because nobody would give him credit or loan him money as everybody was afraid to trust him to do anything more responsible than janitorial work, which he had no skill for. Say his name was Smith and his friend was Johnson. Johnson found that Smith was ripe for his new scheme of getting even. The idea was that Smith was to live in a new city and change his name. Johnson felt that he could not do that because while in prison, um, he had suffered something, um, something wrong with his walk. So he had a gate that was you know, uneven. So he felt that people would not trust him with that gate. So he wouldn't do that. So Johnson gave Smith money to start this new scheme in another city. So Smith, with a new name, started a modest office and paid for it out of Johnson's money, of which a thousand or two should be banked in Smith's new name. More was forthcoming from Johnson if and when Smith needed it. The furnishing of the office should be plain and good, and they must be credited. When the bill was presented, it must be promptly paid for by a check. The approach must be to impress his creditors. He pay, if he paid by cash, he would not be noticed as a man of means and honesty. So as soon as his credit was established, he began to borrow money. First small sums, and then larger as his credit grew every time, taking care to pay ahead of time, receiving the required discount. We all know how that works, right? If you pay ahead of time of your loan, the interest payments go down, right? In short, Smith, with the new name, was to live for five years as a strictly honest man who had everything charged and paid when he said he would pay, and he was getting rich fast. Johnson calculated that in five years of this sort of living, Smith's credit would be good for a cool 500000 in cash. At the end of five years, Smith was to borrow all he could lay his hands on, and with Johnson, skip for parts unknown. Scheme worked like a charm. Smith, with his new name, commanded over 500,000 in cash outside of his flourishing business, which could not be turned into cash as it would arouse suspicion and thus hurt the credit rating. All those years, Smith lived well, though not extravagantly, and that was another aid to his growing credit. So just before the end of the five years, Smith went to see Johnson, who was kept informed of his progress secretly. 
His first words were, Johnny, I can't do it. Five years of living like an honest man have made me prize honesty above everything else. I can't throw away the clean credit nor close my fine business. I have built up my heart and pride in it, and to desert it now would kill me. How do you suppose Johnson felt? He drew a long breath, and then he smiled. Smitty, I am with you. These five years of helping you to be square, of taking pride in your success, have made me see things I've never dreamed of before. Why, Smitty, it's easier to get an honest living than a dishonest one. And a fella feels a heap better doing it. So they went into business together and prospered. <laughs> So what is the good behind that story? The intention. You have financial pearls in it as well. Pay your bills before they do. Pay your loan before interest accrues and all that. So it's not a bad story to think about. It's a simple story. So the intention at the beginning is to get even. And that was overtaken by the truth of honesty and freedom, which is natural to us anyway. As it is full of perceptions which over time, as they deliberately change their modus operandi, the universal law faithfully received the impress of honest, straightforward living, and they were handsomely rewarded. So once the vision of life more abundant is set and we follow through with spiritual practices like our prayer of our affirmation, this moves us forward in the direction of a greater expansion of life's givingness, and we experience all that to the fullness of God's glory. We teach a simple method which assists us in that direction. Recognition, the first step. Second step, unification. Third step, realization of what is it we want to experience. Are you are. Are you ready for setting the new vision? Right? Recognition is God as the attribute we desire to experience, whether it be in the form of health, prosperity, creative self-expression, wisdom, peace, love, right action, joy. Second step, unification. God as us is us. We are one with the attributes selected for expression. Third step, realization. The revelation of God as us is us for us. Therefore, I can experience peace in my home if the attribute is peace. A greater expression of the perfect life that God is experiencing itself as us is God as health. I am one with health, therefore I experience wholeness, perfection in my body temple. In last month's Science of Mind magazine, Dr. Jane Claypool was quoted, and I, and I state this, we state our desire. We accept that it is ours, and we release the thought to universal intelligence. And another way to say that is we release it to universal law, which receives it impressed of our thoughts, and acts upon it. So we release this affirmative prayer and we get out of the way so it can do its work. So at the end of the thir this three-step simple prayer, we say, I release my thoughts to law with thanksgiving and so it is. Our business must be to keep our mental circuits clear and prepared for manifestation. Smithy and Johnson did what was needed to be done, and it certainly turned out to bless their lives. Our intentions, hopes, perceptions must be clear on a life that supports our growth and unfoldment, and then we let it go. We can set our vision on a life that is a delight to ourselves and our environment. That great faithfulness is our life now, 
and it is a promise that is steadfast and sure. Our textbook reminds us on page 309, and I quote, we should be careful to distinguish daydreaming and wistful wishing from really dynamic and creative treatment or affirmative prayer. When we treat, we do not wish, we know. We do not dream, we state. We do not hope, we accept. We do not pray, we announce. We do not expect something is going to happen. We believe that it has already happened, end of quote. So we don't petition or plea bargain. It's not necessary. Luke 12, verse 3 states, Your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Our prayer can therefore be one of thanksgiving and release as the kingdom of good is always at hand. Our hope is not wishy-washy. We are certain. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. End of quote. Indeed, our hope anchors the soul in the truth of our being. Our prayers are backed by principle, spiritual law, and we must consciously bring this to mind rather than on mere perceptions. There is nothing to withhold good from us. We are our prayers. We are the good that we seek to experience. We are our visions. And I read this quote for you. Spirit exists in the absolute. As the individual grows spiritually, the effect becomes more apparent on the relative. Words of Dr. Sonia Lambie Davidson. So as we expand our consciousness through prayer and other spiritual practices, meditation, contemplation, with the result of a clearer perception of our true relation to the absolute, we deepen our spiritual communion, this personal communion with that originating spirit, which is indeed our life, our love, and beauty. So we can truly experience a life that is a delight to God. So let's affirm together. I'll read it once, and then you say it with me. I am spiritually centered. My life, hold on, my, I'm spiritually centered. My life enfolds in wonderful, unique, creative ways. All right? Together, I am spiritually centered. My life enfolds in wonderful, unique, creative ways. I am not convinced. Come, come, come. All right, you may learn it now. I am spiritually centered. My life enfolds in wonderful, unique, creative ways. Again, I am spiritually centered. My life enfolds in wonderful, unique, creative ways. You see, this slip of the tongue, you're, you want to say, um, unfolds. It's in falls. The work is within before it comes out. You see? That's the way it goes. All right? So, yes, indeed, friends, we are spiritually centered. Our life infolds and then unfolds in wonderful, unique, creative ways. We are spiritual giants. That is the truth about each and every one of us. Namaste. Thank uh you. -huh.